excited about this panel um, because for a few minutes we're going to veer off course uh, of what has been the subject matter, which is data, and begin to talk a little bit more about how the data gets used. And data gets used in the investment process. And so the panelists um, all have business practices that develop and implement financial strategies for their clients. And I'm excited to hear their opinions on, on a number of subjects. And so with that, um, I'm Andrew Lazarus. Uh, I'm the Managing Director at Barrel Consulting. And I run Barrel Consulting's uh, real estate practice. And would our panel please introduce themselves? My name is Mark Leeds. I'm a tax partner with Mayor Brown. I specialize in cross-border finance, uh, whether or not it's hedge funds, private wealth, and financial institutions. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Keith Wu. I work for China Everbright Limited uh, as the managing director and head of uh, uh, public equity investments. Uh, China Everbright Limited is a uh, cross-border investment company uh, listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange since 1987. Uh, we belong to the larger China Everbright Group, which is one of the two financial conglomerate uh, licensed by the uh, China State Council. Thank you. Yeah, hello, Bobby Afshar with Lehman Bush. Uh, I run the newly formed Wealth Management Division, so I've been tasked with spearheading that. Um, Lehman Bush is, uh, was established in 2001. Uh, it is a partnership between the presidential Bush family and Mr. Edward Lehman. Edward Lehman is an American lawyer out of Chicago. Uh, been practicing law in China for about 30 years. Uh, that practice, uh, the legal practice is half of the firm, the other half of the firm is financial in nature. So, Mark, I'd like to start out um, asking a couple of questions. So, clearly, um, in the U.S., the discussion of du jour about, in both um, taxes and real estate, is the economic opportunity zone funds. And I thought that maybe you could talk to our audience, uh, give them a sense of what the economic opportunity zone funding is about, and explain what happens if a Chinese investor um, sells an asset in the U.S. and has a capital gain of it. What happens when they, under those circumstances? There is traditionally, I guess until the last couple of years, uh, there has been a gigantic flow of Chinese money into U.S. real estate. Obviously, under the current circumstance, that flow is slowed down, uh, but nonetheless, it continues. And there are a lot of Chinese investors who have done extremely well in U.S. real estate. Our residential market has been up 65% in the last 10 years. The commercial market is up 40%. What the U.S. has done is it imposes a tax on dispositions of U.S. real property by Chinese investors. It's not personal to Chinese investors. It applies to all non-U.S. investors who invested in real estate. Uh, over that, however, as part of the Trump Tax Act uh, enacted at the end of 2017, there is a significant opportunity for Chinese investors who currently hold U.S. real estate to be able to mitigate the tax burden that would be imposed on a disposition, provided that they do a reinvestment. And that reinvestment has to be into what's referred to as a qualified opportunity zone. The opportunity zones are census tracts that the uh, Congress and the Internal Revenue Service designated as in need of some investment. Uh, the good news is that they're not all uh, low income places and they're not all places that are deserted or otherwise unfavorable for investment. So if a Chinese investor who currently holds US real estate were to dispose of the real estate and not reinvest into the U.S., there could be a tax as high as 37% on its gains in the United States. What the Qualified Opportunity Fund investment strategies allow you to do is both reduce that tax by up to 15% and avoid paying the tax until 2026. In order to get those two substantial advantages, the Chinese investor would have to reinvest into another real estate project located in one of these zones. 
the thing that makes it even more interesting than simply the deferral and the opportunity to reduce the tax is that all gains on the disposition of the new investor investment will be tax free. That's what the 2017 Act did, is it allows Chinese investors who have already invested in real estate to dispose of those investments, use the pre-tax gains for new investments, uh, get a reduced rate of tax on the old investment, and completely avoid tax on the new investment. It is an astounding opportunity. It's really a once-in-a-lifetime kind of provision that was enacted as part of uh, the Trump tax bill. And it's one that all Chinese investors who have current investments in U.S. real estate or considering investments in U.S. real estate should know about because it creates an opportunity to avoid the one real big downside about coming into the U.S. And that's that 37% tax burden. Thank you. Uh, Keith. So uh, there are a number of second generation and new tech entrepreneurs in the Chinese market. Are they more receptive to professional asset management? And how are you handling um, alternative investments and diversification of those investments? I think you are right to say that uh, uh, that actually in China, I think the family office uh, business opportunities are lucrative uh, given that uh, there are more technology entrepreneurs generated, you know, uh, especially with the unveil of the uh, technology board recently in Shanghai. And uh, you also see the trend of the first generation entrepreneurs. They are retiring and passing their business or wealth to the second generation who are more receptive to wealth management in general, who are more receptive to giving money for others to manage rather than putting into their own business. So you are right about that. However, uh, I think there are uh, a few uh, uh, boundaries that you need to handle. Uh, first thing is uh, 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 a lot of the, uh, uh, because it's a first generation uh, uh, wealth or second generation wealth, so a lot of the assets are still tied up in the illiquid asset, in the private assets. Or, or even if it is a stocks, it's a listed company, majority stocks that are not easy to get rid of, uh, you know, a note. So uh, there is a clear difference between uh, between assets and net assets or liquid assets uh, because if you are wealth managers, uh, generally speaking, you are dealing with the liquid assets. So the other thing is, uh, I think I think trust is a, a very precious asset in China. Uh, uh, I think the either the first generation entrepreneurs or the uh, uh, first generation technology entrepreneurs or the second generation uh, 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 would have to learn how to deal with uh, external managers, how to understand external managers, and how to build up a trust. So I think that's very important, especially when you talk about alternative investment, which are typically uh, quite transparent, uh, more than often liquid. So, so how to build up trust uh, uh, is a key issue. Thank you. So, Bobby, um, how does Lehman Bush uh, view wealth management for high net worth clients, for your high net worth clients? And the second part of the question, um, what kind of opportunities have you seen in, in the market for your clients to be able to invest in? Uh, I think the opportunities are growing. Uh, especially in terms of product offering. Um, but to piggyback on something Keith said, I think what's interesting in this transition between first generation and second generation wealth transfer is succession planning. Uh, from a Western standpoint, I think that uh, the age of maturity to take part in family business decisions typically happens at a sooner age than in Asia. I think most people know this. Um, but in getting them comfortable at a younger age with sort of investment products and making and being part of the decision making process. I think that's key in making the family feel comfortable. Uh, but uh, historically, we view the touch point of wealth management in China as primarily immigration and education, right? If we're talking new emerging middle class, let's say two million to 20 million uh, in wealth. Those are the two primary 
primary vehicles in terms of outbound investment or something they're going to have to do overseas outside of their comfort zone. Uh, and so we work with a lot of channel partners whose primary vocation are those two assets. Uh, now what's happened in the past decade is we want this product. Uh, if you can sell it to us, we'll buy it. Uh, I don't think we're at that same point with education and immigration. There are secondary and tertiary issues like tax, for example, that we've spoken about, like privacy, like succession planning, like what types of alternative investments can you give? Um, uh, as a lawyer by trade, you know, we always want to talk about the downside risks. I heard on an earlier panel something we were talking about is um, a lot of the conversations we have are, okay, what's the risk? Um, you know, legally speaking, how do you limit my tax liability? Uh, but at the end of the day, it often comes down to yield, uh, especially in China. So really, how much am I going to make is still, to me, the primary investment consideration. Thank you. Um, I want to go to a kind of a lightning round of questions, if you will, uh, where um, to give our audience some sense of the scope and size of the marketplace that we're talking about. So, Mark, for example, the U.S. The US Treasury um, has said it expects $100 billion of economic opportunity zone investment. Is that a real number? And where are we at in the process of, of, of raising that $100 billion for those funds? The $100 billion number that the Treasury has been using as the size of the opportunity zone investments is definitely on the low side. It probably is three to four times that number. And the reason why it's as high as it is is because that investment opportunity is not simply limited to real estate. It's limited to operating businesses that actually conduct operations within opportunity zones. And the Treasury has been very generous in the regulations that it's issued, enabling businesses that do substantial amount of works outside of opportunity zones to get those benefits. And for example, even certain trading outfits uh, that locate within opportunity zones can have disposition gains exempted from tax. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, crypto traders, and uh, I've worked with a number that are relocated within opportunity zones, and those businesses can reap the benefits. So it's anything other than, there's a list of, I think, about 13 businesses that don't qualify, and they include golf courses and financial trading. Um, however, crypto is out of that, uh, they're not treated as financial trading. And so the uh, creation of operating businesses in addition to real estate uh, opportunities, I think will cause the size of the market in qualified opportunity funds to grow substantially. So just as a little follow-up to that, um, and to clear it up for our audience, my understanding is that real estate is only, what, 12%? of the number? I think that that's really hard to say exactly what percentage. Uh, to date, when, for, date, for the most part with syndicated offerings, uh, we've seen very heavily real estate oriented. Uh, the companies that I work with, the private wealth divisions that I work with also uh, tend to uh, in bespoke uh, real estate deals. The opportunities that I've seen in operating businesses have really come from the entrepreneurial side and not not through the banking sector. I, I think it's, it's very difficult so early in the game to sort of state what percentage of the businesses are going to be pure real estate businesses versus op versus operating businesses. Okay, thank you. Um, so according to China Daily and Price Waterhouse Coopers, uh, 106 billionaires uh, were minted. Uh, and created weekly in China in 2018. So, Anthony and Keith, this is a question for the two of you. Is that a real number? And how big is the family office investment pool in China? Is that number sustainable, by the way? Do we, are we going to continue minting two billionaires every week till you know for the next 10 years? I mean, I think we would always like it if the pace of growth was sustainable into the foreseeable future, but uh, all numbers everywhere, especially in these markets, can be quite dubious. Um, in terms of the rise of the family office, um, 
I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we have to be loose in how we define family office. Obviously, it has a specific definition in Western markets and in America. And, um, you know, in China, it can mean like the three richest families on the cul de sac and the golf course pulled their money together. Um, so it's sort of informal in how it's defined, but yeah, we're very optimistic. Uh, our wealth management division was just created uh, less than 18 months ago. So we're planning for the long term. Yeah, I often think that uh, the, the, the uh, opportunity set is tremendous. Um, but but on this, at the same time, I have to highlight, uh, as what I highlighted just now, uh, a lot of people are asset rich and cash poor. You know? Although that also presents another set of opportunity if you can help these guys to monetize their assets. Right? Uh, remember what I said before that building trust is key. So if you can help those people to monetize their assets, I think that's an excellent way of starting your business relationship. Or like what my fellow panelists said, if you can help with their uh, 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 like uh, immigration needs or the education, their, their children's education needs, that's an excellent uh, door opener for their business. And only after that, we will be able to talk about uh, investment products or investment management. Thank you. So, um, there is an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. And given the current geopolitical uncertainties, and clearly some economic headwinds that began in 2018, what are some of the challenges you're seeing, Mark, in the U.S. and you know Keith and Bobby in the China markets in, in the near future? Our, our political climate has never been more polarized uh, than it is today. And I think that that's uh, a very sad reflection of the rise of nationalism in the last personally. Uh, that being said, the U.S. dollar has continued to be a very, very strong asset and a safe harbor. As I mentioned earlier, the U.S. real estate markets and the U.S. financial markets uh, continue to be uh, wealth creators and uh, valuations continue to move up uh, as the earnings. And so what I would say is that we're, we're continuously seeing from Asia um, a very significant inflows in, into U.S. assets. It probably isn't, and, and I think that the inflows that we're seeing today are much more thoughtful than in some earlier times when there were uh, most notably some early Japanese investments in the early and mid 80s, I think, uh, were uh, done uh, more on the basis of hope and valuations. Uh, my particular firm is very active on uh, doing inbound uh, investments from Asia into U.S. real estate and into U.S. financial products. And, we're seeing, we're continuing to see very strong interest, notwithstanding, as you noted, that it is an interesting times. Yeah, I think I think from the uh, Chinese family office uh, perspective, I think the uh, the first challenge you have is really uh, how to find good investment opportunities to uh, deploy your money. Uh, I think in the past 10, 20, 30 years, I think the entrepreneurs typically the best way to deploy their money is to put into their own business. But that's no longer true because of the GDP slowdown and a lot of uh, traditional uh, industries are actually uh, uh, not seeing a good investment opportunity anymore. So that is why you see the private investment uh, figures in China are actually trending down in recent years. And then uh, typically for Chinese family wealth, uh, uh, housing is a big uh, asset to deploy. But given the government's, uh, uh, so clearly China is a policy-driven market. So given China's central government policy uh, leading more towards uh, uh, getting away from uh, real estate investment, I mean on onshore, uh, actually uh, uh, we, we think that the uh, real estate is not, in the onshore real estate is not a uh, very uh, investment attractive investment vehicle and more. And then and then if you talk about private uh, uh, you know private equity and, uh, and the other things uh, with the uh, economic slowdown you also 
uh, be increasingly difficult to find investment opportunities. So, so I think the number one challenge is really how to find good investment opportunities uh, onshore and, uh, and possibly offshore. I, I don't want to expand too far here. And then the second thing is uh, how to find trustworthy uh, investment managers to help you, whether it's uh, internally uh, or externally. I think that's also a, a challenge for the friendly uh, investment. Um, yeah, the Lehman Bush occupies sort of a weird space, uh, the, given that it stems from the Bush family. I know everybody's familiar with HW and W and, and Jet, uh, and this is Neil, more business focused than political. Uh, but the Bush family history goes back a lot longer than that in China. Um, over the past four decades, China has known a Bush in the White House or as a vice president for two of them. Um, before that, um, George H.W. Bush was the first unofficial ambassador to China dating back to 74. I mean, so that predates what we as Americans know as the opening up with Nixon and Kissinger. Um, so part of our job or role we see as, particularly given the economic trade winds, is somewhat diplomatic in nature. Um, and in China, in U.S. business dealings, that's not always been dissimilar from economics. Typically, I think the view, the lens we view, China through, even on a diplomatic level, has always been economic and intertwined. So um, I don't think that's changed. I think there's been some continuity there for us uh, in terms of the trade ones. Um, and yeah, I think like he said, it's just for us, if our channel partners are focused on children's education and immigration products, we don't really need to educate uh, the actual client um, who is becoming more sophisticated but maybe not quite there yet. Our job is to more educate the channel partners who are going to actually be interfacing with the clients day to day. Thank you. Um, so we have about 13 minutes left. And was wondering if anyone in the audience had any questions for our panelists. Uh, wanted to ask something? Andrew, I have a question, actually. exchange controls. How do we as a law firm assist clients in moving money internationally? And I, I would say this, that our, our firms and firms like ours, at, at this, is referred to sort of generically as big law, have extensive relationships with any number of wealth management divisions at uh, the large investment banks. We regularly work with any number, whether it's Goldman or JPM or uh, even more boutique firms like Jeffries uh, and Co. Uh, we, we do substantial amounts of, of work. And I know one of the things that we actually see a lot coming from Asia is the desire for anonymity when the money hits the U.S. shore, that they really don't want to be making filings with the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. And the privacy is very important to be maintained. And so, um, in addition to more of those sort of traditional, we also do a lot of work with uh, Swiss financial institutions. And so, uh, as well as having networks within a lot of the uh, more traditional venues that provide complete anonymity, such as Luxembourg and Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands is a lot less anonymous today with the advent of CRS and FATCA. Um, but what FACA and CRS uh, always try to do is they're looking for residents of uh, countries that are parties. So FACA is always looking for U.S. persons. CRS is always looking for a, Europe, a European uh, uh, so there's a So there's still opportunities uh, to be able to come into the United States um, on a relatively anonymous basis. And as I mentioned earlier, and, um, and as, as Andrew pointed out, you know, I can't stress enough the uh, real watershed change that the Trump tax bill offered for Asian investment into the United States. Uh, previously, there was such a, a uh, 
high tax hurdle uh, in order to take the money out once it was here. And what the Trump tax bill has done is created a huge opportunity on top of being able to move the money in a discreet fashion, uh, now in a tax-free fashion. Is that, is that responsive to what you were asking? Well, when you say moving money offshore, are you asking from a Chinese perspective as opposed to? Oh. So I would say, I, I would say this is that we could be of, of significant assistance. We have offices here in Hong Kong uh, throughout the world, but uh, it's hard to say what that that's a. I, I don't think I've ever tried to quantify that as a perspective, as opposed to doing a deal. Right. If the money is originating in a particular jurisdiction, what we would focus on is the most tax-efficient and uh, most tax-efficient way of moving that money from where it was originated uh, to the investment opportunity. I'm not sure that we would consider uh, moving money in and of itself as as a business model. Keith, you want to answer that too? Yeah, I will add that uh, on that. Uh, uh, I, I think it will be very extremely risky to use uh, helping clients to move money offshore as a door opener, you know? uh, especially given the increasing power of local police. Right? So and uh, and 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 the due respect to forest control regulation. So usually, I think in the uh, in the Chinese wealth management market. We usually have a clear division between offshore wealth management versus onshore wealth management. So the offshore wealth managers usually only handle their offshore wealth, which is already there, given that you do enough KYC, right? But but never try to help your clients move money offshore, right? So and then of course that's the uh, U.S. dollar needs, and then you have the onshore wealth management needs, which is renminbi denominated. But equally lucrative, but usually that's two set of opportunities for different wealth management practitioners. I would say. Another question. Sorry, just to follow on that really, and for Keith, I'm just interested. Um, assuming that the onshore portion of wealth is is fast greater than the offshore for ultra high net individuals, and I presume that people would agree that is. Um, you mentioned the lack of the limited investment opportunities that exist today um, for a variety of reasons. Um, like, what do you think is the trigger? What changes that? In terms of, you know, the what what is the conditions that's going to change such that there is a, a wider variety of investment opportunities um, available for wealthy individuals onshore to invest in? Is it is it a is it regulatory change? Is it um, market opening? Is it other foreign foreign players coming in? Is it change in the, in the economy? Like, what will grow the range of investment opportunities that is available? You know, what do you think is that is the trigger that will suddenly open up so that you know your traditional investment pro, pro, uh, products that a private bank would offer to ultra high net are there and available? Uh, I think I think uh, you know where there is a real demand there is a way. I think the problem in the past is you know especially in the onshore market if you can get. Uh, fixed income product or quasi fixed income product with quasi uh, government guarantee, uh, which offers you uh, yields at eight percent or ten percent or twelve percent, then you don't need investment managers, you know, because you just put the money over there. Right? So with the government cracking down on those uh, quasi uh, fixed income guarantees, I think the uh, there will be increasing needs for. Uh, for higher uh, return product, but of course you need to understand it comes with higher risk. Right? So, and, and that's where the professional money management can see. Uh, and then, uh, because I'm, I'm managing uh, uh, public equity investments, so if you talk about in you know, a strategic perspective, like, like uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, in the recent years, I think the Chinese government actually, uh, especially CSRC, I think they did a real good, really good job to really 
uh, you know, uh, change the regulations, opening up the market, and not only uh, not only opening the Chinese market to the uh, international investors via those MSCI inclusion, etc., but also via the Connect scheme, opening the like the Hong Kong stocks or the London stocks or etc. to the Chinese investors. So I think. I think the opening up of the financial market is actually happening faster than a lot of the local practitioners' uh, origin expectation, including. Them. So uh, uh, it is because China is usually top-down driven, right? So it's very it's relatively harder for the practitioners to affect what's happening on, you know, on top. But uh, but I would say it's really happening in a uh, in a faster pace than expected. So are, are there other there are other questions, Mr. Dad. Uh, we just spoke about the relation between the U.S. and China. What about Europe? I mean, what about uh, how could you make uh, investing in uh, China and taking advantage of the Chinese growth for European investors? What are the limitations? What do you propose? Bobby, do you want to take a, a shot at that? European inbound investment. The question was European inbound investment into China, and how do you structure that? Um, historically, that's more for our, for our firm. That's a law firm question. So really, who we service are medium-sized enterprises, um, either still coming into the Chinese market, European, U.S., wherever, or those leaving, whether with the supply chain or winding up a business. Um, uh, but again, that's more on the legal side. Uh, in terms of how we see those opportunities, I would say it's not the same industries that we've serviced before at all. I would say for the most part, it's fast-moving consumer goods companies looking maybe specifically out of the Nordics. There's a lot of those coming to us trying to get into the China market. Uh, I would say that's the biggest area of influx we've seen. I'll respond a little bit to that because I do a lot of work with uh, outbound investment into China, mostly into public equities. And I really, uh, really have to say that currently it's mostly derivative. That there are only there are a very, very few number of firms who actually uh, trade on the Chinese market, and the derivative exposure is being offered generally through mutual funds and other uh, collective investment vehicles. And Really, I think one of the greatest scares that people have is the, of the probability that capital gains recognized by offshore investors uh, in the Chinese equity markets are going to be retroactively subject to tax. Um, there's been, uh, uh, I, I think that the Chinese tax authorities have made it clear that the current exemption is going to be repealed and, it, and the effective date of that repeal is uncertain. And that the, the few, uh, and, companies that are dealing in Chinese equities are li liable to be held responsible for those taxes. And the deals I work on in this space, there is always a clawback with respect to the ultimate investor. And so I think that one of the things that's really hurting uh, your, both European and a U.S. domestic investment um, on the Chinese equity markets is the uncertainty around the tax. You know, there's an old saw in my business which says it doesn't matter uh, the tax is good or the tax is bad. What matters is that the tax is certain. Uh, it's the uncertainty around the effective day of capital gains. Essentially what India did, right, which is uh, ultimately tax capital gains recognized by traders on their markets. Uh, I will add that, uh, uh, you know, because in, in China Everbra, I actually manage a Cayman fund, uh, uh, which is doing greater China uh, uh, after return equity strategy. Uh, uh, but, you know, my general observation from my part dealing with, uh, because I deal with, uh, uh, you know, capital control team of uh, like uh, major European and uh, uh, U.S. banks in the past a few years, and, and they, they do, you know, introduce clients for potential investors from Europe and U.S. My general observation is that European investors are more uh, risk-taking than the U.S. investors. They are more uh, you know, accommodative uh, if you are uh, uh, smaller in size or if your strategy are, uh, are a little bit uh, uh, unconventional from Western size. For example, if you have certain beta 
you, you take some beta exposure rather than just pure alpha. I think for a lot of uh, uh, SLKers or uh, in US, that is uh, uh, that is not the kind of exposure they want. But I think the US, uh, the European fund of fund investors or SLKers, they are uh, you, you know they are actually quite receptive of that. I, I don't know why, but that, that's really uh, what I feel. So I. I I'd like to thank you. Because, because they are mass educated. <laughs> so, uh, please, we're, we're out of time, uh, unfortunately. And please give our panelists a nice round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.